Um, the record, the Black Fungio, got back in for three, three trade magazines, major things. Not just Billboard, but it's two other magazines keeping charts also, and they were kind of like keeping each other honest. Because, you know, if you said that let's just put somebody out and the other to a skip a, a quarter of a million different from what you're stating, that that would look funny. But now that there's only no more, who really knows what's going on, right? But, Sorry, what was the competition for Billboard back then? Cash Box and the Record World Magazine. Okay. Both of them important, and all three of them, if you would pick for a record of the week, they would put you on the cover. Wow. But, no, but there would be like four albums, smaller shots, than filling a whole cover, and different sections. One would be the country record of the week, one would be the pop, and you know, and one would be the, the rhythm and blues. It's all changing depending on what year it was and what uh, styles of it both. So, Cashbox, Record World, and Bill Barn all picked my record for the best album in the world of the week, and Variety Magazine chimed in, and, the, and then Rolling Stone did theirs, and they said it was, the record was so bad um, that people should discourage me. Uh, from trying to pretend, oh, they called it a vanity album, suggesting that I paid for it, that if it weren't for my money, that I would never have, have a record contract. But bear in mind, the guy was trying to ruin me because he was paid a couple thousand to do just that. And Rolling Stone gives so many great reviews to, to uh, a black men, to people whose company bought ads. They always spoke. And it was a fool, you couldn't get a review unless your company bought it all. And nobody had ever bought any of it. But I won't get the details. But anyway, this guy was paid money to, he might have liked me, but he was paid money to badmouth me. So uh, I, a heroin addict, a heroin addict with a gambling problem, uh, might have laid to Jerry Luxor's wife. I didn't mention that in the thing, but that was the rumor that they started Ouch. about me. It really, really awful. And I was so I was so tortured uh, over this girl named Carrie who I was I thought I'd never ever get over her. And I just sat and waited day and night for her to come home and <laughs> any anyhow. Uh, I never could have even been interested in anybody else in the years of that. I mean, Terry Wester's new 29-year-old wife, and I was his discovery. No, I think he sent me the Muscle Shoals to part of the Lisa of Franklin, and how could that have happened? So we're talking, I'm sorry, we're talking about the next record on actual for of that thing, not the Black Fuzzy. But every count of my abilities and and the others when they were still alive when they just so when Pussy Cascade Park came out and they had to be ruined. Um we could Jerry Wexler and the entire the region's entire band and production team team aside Tom Dowd uh, who, who, um, uh, Tom, I was quoted saying it's a private letter to Jerry Wexler. Linhart, Lucky Linhart's voice is so bad he made very cool for some of the people who are so. So, how different people taste are. I got not that that shit bothered because I got people who do like my stuff. And so I don't worry about that. But it's bad when it actually makes you look so bad that no record company wants to sign you ever again, just in case. And that's what happened to me. So I moved my ass up the hall with and started doing. I had a one point nineteen seventy. I got a job to be the musical director and a regular 
on a show that would converge with the Supreme Court made a decision in 75 that were no programs for the family to watch together, too much TNA, and too much, too much violence. So the Supreme Court actually passed a decision saying that from 7 to 9, every night of the week, there would be what henceforth would be known as family hour, and it could only be stuff that you could sit down and safely and watch with your children. Then we were the first show book to do that. It was called Cause, C-O-S. It was a variety show starring Bill Cosby. I was just such a pleasant. And um, I didn't need to be the musical director. I became the assistant to the musical director. I mean, that's a 26 hour day gig for musical at the TV show. You know that, that Bill Cosby show you speak of on your Wikipedia site, it says that there's no, they can't find any uh, recordings anymore of that uh, original Bill Cosby show. He controls it, and at the time, the recent side. This, this is a yeah. beautiful complex story. Oh. Uh, you know, Bill was on that amazing show, I Spy, and it was amazingly successful. Oh, and it was beautiful. It was a black guy and a white guy. Oh, my God. So, you know, he had, now I'm not saying he picked the right scripts to sign to, but Bill had, Bill Cosby uh, had five shows after I spike, and not one of them ever went to a second season. And when we asked him to do stupid, he figured, well, it's never going to go anywhere. You know? And the problem was the black churches started saying, Every, you people gotta go home and watch this show called Cause on Sunday night. It's on the hour on ABC Sunday night. The lineup, we had Jeff Altman, Person Harry Ramsey, Betty White with the Raider, Charlie Callis with the Raider, Artie Johnson, Lord Martin Laffin with the Raider, and these guys were top of their forms. You know, telling the people like that, they were just different. It's always there. And the point was to stack the prison that we could stand in Williams for seven years and suck in share for whatever and duck the injury. And he and, and was the head right for that. So he had the plan down and it you create characters to which and bring in that person and you record two years worth of material and put it in a can. And every time you want the little guy to come out and get hit over the head with uh, by who's fuzzy with the first, you know? Very, very interesting. Exactly, and that's the reruns right now on uh, Decades TV. We watch it every weekday, three times a week. It's on uh, two different things. Wow. And we watch develop in the first season. They didn't put any water on it. And the reason it was very sucking to me, and this slow motion punch uh, single would come in, and slow motion and suck out of the thing. And, and it started happening with Golden Pond and, and, and Lily Tom and I said, boy, they're going to get in trouble if they don't stop that. Just, it went until well into the, uh, into the first season that they realized when they toss up, they could throw up a bit of water from And now it's in the second season that they're starting to do more and more. And they got a famous act the other day. I'm sorry, I can't wait for close. But they did the reruns. And also, Peter Kahn, the great uh, TV show, supported by Ed Mentini. It's worth the story of Ed Mentini's music, you know. He created, he created the play for what a TV detective who we struggle with sound like. And then, Peter Gunn. Peter Gunn. Peter Gunn. It was produced by Blake Edwards. They went on to do the Pink Panther movies together and then seen the score those. So they did, they did a, a, a satire of the TV detective 
the movie, and Andy knew how to joke on that because she had originated that song. You know what? Um, just I, I digress. Kind of. Uh, uh, the I, I, uh, uh, I see these Rolling Stone ads. Uh, Michael Parks was uh, was a uh, uh, singer. Michael Parks has an album. I know. I can't. I can't remember who he was, and I'm, I'm pretty sure I've never heard him. He was, but, on, you know, he was on TV. He was on TV. He just left his body in the last couple. Oh, what show? Uh, Cable? Uh, no, 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 he, uh, no, no, I'm saying Michael Parks left his body. He, he went to the other side. I know that. Oh, oh did, you, did you ever know that? Uh, okay. uh, no, no, but I heard his name, and I never heard him, but I thought you said he was on TV. Well, yeah, he was, um, uh, I mean, uh, 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 what? Well, we, so, we have good stucco here. 
He came back to space to see me, and we gave the impression that he had come to see me. But Doug Kershaw was a giant, incredibly talented guy. He was interested because the, I had the feeling he loved what I was doing. I'm not sure. Oh. I worry about that a lot sometimes. Oh. I, I, man, I worry about it a lot. Well, the six degrees of separation thing is blowing my mind because uh, I saw that, uh, I saw this uh, page I'm telling you about that Stephen Feeder provided us from the 71 LA Free Press. And yes. the first thing I saw, I, I said, well, that doesn't have anything about that. But it, uh, it says something in this article right next to your ad, uh, or this article is called The Elephant Story. Okay. Wow. Uh, amazing the cosmic uh, coincidence. And uh, your ad with Doug Kershaw is right underneath uh, the Whiskey and Go Go ad with uh, Jack and Bill Maximus, both the uh, Mama Lion and Freedom, and Eric Burden and Jimmy Witherspoon. Jimmy Witherspoon was wow. just with us until like a few weeks ago, I think. Anyway, take any one of those things and tell us a story about Eric Burden. Oh, oh. I have a wonderful story about Eric Burden, one that when the big family is from Long Island, who also knew me, uh, uh, called me and asked if I would be the special surprise guest at Eric Burden's, I believe it was the 63rd or 67th birthday party. Yeah. And, he, and he flew me down there. And, uh, but no, we drove down there because I brought my stretcher named Chaos from uh, Oakland, who's been doing stretch and stuff uh, without K on George Quill for, for years. And the interesting thing about the end is the hotel did the bootleg tape of him by studs, but twin studs when they were 13 and 14. We bought bootleg copies of chaos, these things on records. And then I made it to the guy who was the final member of the report. We did all. Our first day rehearsing was the morning that Jerry died, and we started writing this, all these songs for Jerry. Wow. And uh, in, in 20 days, we get the songs that we heard. Wow. Amazing. And so that went too far the wrong way. But there's a young kid, who I call him a young kid, huh. like about 40, Eric Brenner, who does a lot of communicating uh, through the things which the people were, were talking to in the internet. <laughs> and he's, he's got two things he can do. One, he's a wonderful radio voice, and he did. Uh, we can use stuff uh, on NBC radio. And um, when he was 19, he met me through Wavy Gravy and uh, had never heard of me, but looked at my records and thought he said, oh, you know who you are. And every time he interviews uh, somebody, he asks them the same for me. He doesn't do it on tape, you know, and put them on the spot. But he just can't find anybody who doesn't know who I was. Until Bob Weir, and he said, you, and he said, you probably remember it with this group, the Seven Sussdale, who had no more in the 60s. He said, oh, yeah, I know you. In my regards. And so I just think he and I should play together. There's something similar. Yeah. I've got another quick uh, kind of loaded question for you. Yes, and he's like me, he loves other people's songs. Oh, yeah, I didn't mean to. Uh, uh, no, go ahead. Go ahead. Because I wanted you to finish that story if you, uh, if you hadn't finished it. Thank you. I think I'm over here. <laughs> okay, um, I better get that poured out for my uh, <laughs> laptop. Battery, but that's just so I can look at things for um, reference. And uh, one exhibit A is uh, people are asking 
uh, about your uh, interactions with Phoebe Snow. So, because of your profile picture on the uh, facade book, the fake book. Oh, yes. I want to know, my quick question is, do you, can you tell us, uh, in 250 words or less, the first and the most recent time you played with Phoebe or sang with Phoebe? Because we know there's some on the Facebook, I mean, on the YouTube. She became to a show of mine when she was uh, 19. Wow. She was listening to the same radio stations that John Lennon was on, and she loved John Lennon. Wow. So she didn't quite understand that I wasn't great. The thing is, WNEW, they would have three concerts in all five groups. Three concerts, but they draw up. Three to twenty thousand. One time, thirty-two thousand people was um, um, Harry, Harry Chapin, Bert Summer, and I. And we drew thirty thousand people in Central Park at the uh, the concrete band uh, band stand. And show. And the show itself exactly. And it's hard to get to. And Mayor Lindsay thought they would lump and schmooze. The youth, and he walks up and gets near the microphone, and everybody booed him off the stage. Doing them say one thing. It was a beautiful concert. Sorry, 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 Buzzy. Was that the New York mayor? Yes, Mayor John Lindsay. Nineteen seventy. It was seventy seventy one. Wow. Here, here we just pictures of Bill Packers and Luther Rice and I playing on the stage. We took on a, a sax player. They came really like a rock jazz thing. I wouldn't say jazz rock, but a rock first thing. The jazz from the eggs. I like to do the, you know, the head to the song, uh, you know, in song, and then everybody's solo on. And that would mean that it was never seen. Billy Van opened for us a few times before they went in the studio, and some people stayed to think that there was some. Uh, I'm sure they would have done that no matter what, but um, it's a very sunny thing to ask me. Uh, I'm not like a summer boy, up to when he was 11, is 22 now, and winning awards and joining the band of young folks who have just started tour with Donald Fagan. Wow. Do what you do with him, right? Yeah. And, it, and he has taken me for years. The next time I come back to New York, he has to play drums. If he feels he's ready and whatever, it's really cute. He's, I look at the he's a real old work on it. This, um, I'm trying not to go on tangents, but I'm not necessarily like okay. speak. Oh, I, I just want to interject. Go. He called me three weeks ago, and not only is he going to drum for these series of gigs I'm going to do in New York in about six or seven months, wow. but he thinks he can give me the whole Steely Dan band. So wow. he'll be tied up to this point if you want. So, um, do you think somebody will be there with a video camera? <laughs> hey, i got to ask you, Buzzy, uh, because this is the uh, 50th uh, anniversary of the Summer of Love, uh, well, I want to uh, not only uh, uh, tell you an uh, interesting thing, but uh, we have this vision of you coming here physically as well to Joshua Tree and maybe performing for us in the Beacon Lounge where we are now, and as well as wonderful place, uh, magical concert that's called uh, First World, which is Bobby First uh, amazing uh, venue up at the entrance to Joshua Tree National Park. And our first, we thought we would be one of the big uh, superstars to show up to her, but actually August 15th, uh, the first real big celebration of the Summer of Love with, is happening there with Melanie. I go out there on roller skates. Beautiful people, I love them. Lay down, lay down. Lay down, let your love go white, go fly up and then I pray it doesn't rain on your candles parade. 
I I I couldn't get that. Oh, I was being silly and saying that I hope I pray it does not rain on your candles parade. Yes. Well, I'm going to put it for me, the very best song, and it's still for me. I don't know, 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 last night. Oh, yeah, I love it. It's on their first album, it, isn't it? We are so in the night. It always seems like you're boring me. I won't keep you alone, but you've got something I need. I have a brand new friend from the lower states. You've got a brand new key. I think that we should get together. We'll oh, see. Yeah. A beautiful song. Well, let's just hope you can all. do a duet with Melanie here a year uh, next summer. Great. Instead of well, me. I'll come down and play, but here's the problem. Okay. Right now, until they fix my shoulder, I can play my, I can play my, maybe the vibraphone. My guitar is limited. And uh, I can play some of the other tunes, but I severely damaged my left hand and the ring finger, the ring finger hits the wrong flat. Oh gosh, this is my knee. See how he looks. Hold on. Another line. Well, uh, that's, that reminds me, we want to get a GoFundMe together for you to help you get one of those fancy little keyboard things that, oh, oh. that, 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 that he can play his uh, music anywhere on. I'm recording a show right now on the other songs that I'm on. May I call you back? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, well, oh, no. Okay, hey, hold on. Not you, Stephen. Okay. Hold on. Yeah. <laughs> I'll call you tomorrow. You can say something about a check, did you? Some money? Dinero? Moving off? Money can't buy you, though. Are you tomorrow, man? Can't find me, love, no. Shut up, Stevie. Okay, fine. I'm back. I was, back. I was singing the Beatles song about money, or whoever wrote that. Uh, beautiful, Buzzy. Uh, what were we talking about last? Melanie, uh, well, oh, you're, you're, you're going to you want to get you, uh, help you get a little portable instrument, get a little fun me going for that. No, I have a portable instrument. No, I am. Uh, well, you said you want to get this uh, little thing that you can carry no, everywhere. No, a fiber no, phone. No, you I told me no, earlier, a uh, few weeks ago, you told me that. I have one. Oh, you got it? I've always had one. I don't know what you're talking about. I thought you said I want to get people to help me get this certain kind of instrument. Oh, no. I wanted, I wanted help paying for the repair. Oh. We were doing my dollars still. Oh. But, uh, um, I'm talking to Dick Karras and a few other people, and hopefully go off with it. The thing is, if I come down and play, I can even play, play chords for my own song I wrote. So somehow we could have to come up uh, with a guitar bass player who would be willing to learn some songs. We got that. There's, there's a thing on SoundCloud, uh, a private SoundCloud thing that we could give to people who uh, might be able to play on the gig and make. Well, let me, let me, let me they can start to practice songs. They can start to practice songs just matching the song order, I mean the chord order of the song the pitches that are on SoundCloud. Um, and I love to do that. But it has to be a couple of people who are good enough to hold it down <laughs> by the trucks, you know? And you get a for San Diego. Yeah, Buzzy, on that note, I, I want to give some kudos to your wonderful uh, son, one of your wonderful sons, uh, Zeno Rasmussen, who helps you get all your music up on SoundCloud and uh, uh, Facebook, etc. Yes. Thank hey, you, Zeno. Zeno has been here uh, on our one of our second Saturday art gallery openings, and we had a wonderful time with him and that wonderful proprietor 
of the uh, ranch up there where he stays, uh, which uh, I think Eric Burden used to up there right there. Uh, every, he, there's some videos of Eric Burden uh, with Eric Gale, no, uh, uh, not the old, uh, the younger Eric. Anyway, uh, at uh, Rip, Rip, uh, Rip Fly Rancho, uh, right near town, and uh, that's when we got Sazino. Boy, I'm having a hard time understanding it. Yeah, I'm sorry. Yeah. What, what I'm trying to say is we saw Zeno here. We saw Zeno here. Can we talk for a second because I'm really lost? Let me talk for a second, please. Because uh, yeah. I just want to, to know, I don't know if you know this story. <clears throat> okay. And I'm hoping to entice people who yet don't understand who I might be and why they should be interested. And uh, I thank you for giving me should be sunny so that I won't be uh, feel desperate or embarrassed to talk a bit about what might be the, the phone rang about 11 years ago. It was Eric Burton. Yeah. He said on the, the Mark and Brian show, they throw this giant cherry thing every Christmas, right? Oh. Just the Mark and and Brian Schiller is doing this thing at the Wilford Theater. And, uh, yeah. and he said, I'm, I'm presenting the new animals for the first time, and I want you to play vibes for the band. Wow. Right? Yeah. So it, it, for a couple thousand people, I believe that's the theater where they filmed the rows, and I was there watching. Wow. Um, Ben Miller and Tommy Simon and my wife Jeannie and the, our drummer with the Vicks would go to eat together in a restaurant at least two times a week. And if that wasn't virtual, she would come and watch us play many times a week. She and Luke were very in love and I was so sad to see them. But, but uh, uh, yeah. like the, uh, I'm swamped over here. I'm swamping, realizing all these things that I've done. It's good to talk about them. Yeah, man. I'm, I'm not even going to charge you my normal $150 an hour therapy fee. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Ah, Christ today. Just remember, we want people to know that we're going to talk about Bob Dylan and how he really saved my life. And I haven't even gotten into this. Wow, that's a good story. I don't think I heard that one. Well, you know that, well, what I would say what he told me, he said, I've written a song and there's a couple of verses about you in it, and I would like you to play vibes on it. Wow. And that's when you and I were talking about my drummer Serge to Can't Cancer, Cancer? He drove the work the chrome horse. Serge Cancerman? He was carrying down his shoulder and signing his cat. And he had hardly even discovered that he put the where is that? Mm-hmm. So from you everything he could steal. Well that was a real person. Serge Cancer? And Philip, Cancer. And Philip was, was concerned that he was really dangerous and wanted to get me out of there. And so he wrote this song, you know, if you got famous, I, I mean, I'm telling you what I think Bob Lippel would think. But, you know, if he gets me in the studio and I hear the lyrics and think about it, that there's some reason. I mean, the first time I met him, I said, man, you are my guy. I got to tell you, I love you. I understand everything you're saying, and I talk fast and regularly, and just listen to bringing it all back home, over and over. I said, you are a really different man. I really got to thank you. And then he goes and writes this song. He's talking about me, and, um, and part of it, he would like me to get me away from the drummer who was dangerous and also he thought maybe I should be in the band or something. 
And he had a couple other guys in there, my buddies, Michael Bloomfield and Harvey Brooks on bass. Yeah. And, you know, he was originally in the Harvey Goldstein. Oh. And at the second, at the second concert with Bill, where he got beat up in the alley and called the Cave, he came into the television where we were all picking up ears and said, well, that, uh, this is that before the concert. Uh, he said, that's it. I'm changing my name to Brooks. He said, it's just too much, man. I, I can't go on feeling that hit from these kids. And he changed it. So he was Harvey Goldstein uh, on bringing it all back home. Wow. And by I went to the physically, it's Harvey Brooks. And then he played on Rich Blue, Miles Davis, Thousand Other of the Kids. He was the bass player for the Thorns. How about that? And never think about it, they never showed the bass player, did they? For the Thorns? No. But there was a rumor that he was just playing the bass with his left hand. Well, he could do that. But even when they were playing live on stage, either Arnie Brooks or Doug LeBon would be in the wings wearing earphones, playing bass. Coming through the bass. I'm sorry, so, did you say the doors? The doors, yes. And we thought it was Ray Manzarek all that time. All that time. Ray Manzarek? Well, it said Ray on the album, but you know, people do this. Wow. Yeah. So, are you telling us that, that, uh, like a Rolling Stone, whatever he calls that song? And he was really yes. singing that to you, that verse? I can tell you how. Ready? Yeah. I mean, it, and that's the second one. The first was, um, um, the, the thing was, he didn't want to tip his whole heart to, to the drummer. He didn't want to piss him off, you know? Yeah. Or, or tip what he was doing. So he said, going to the final school, all right, Miss Lonely, like a girl, Miss, M-I-S-S. Yeah. And so that already was a distraction, you know, it was like a, a magician distract, you know. Yeah. That's what he called it. Um, diversion. Diversion, that's it. Diversion, so subconsciously, there's a few thinking about it's about a girl. You know? I always did. So going to the fire school, all miss Bunny, but you know you only used to get used to it. In the first 20 minutes that I spoke to him, when he came up and, and spoke to me in between sets, I was either playing vibes with Tim Harden or the great friend Neil. Yeah. <laughs> and it could have been Richie Haywins, but I know it wasn't Richie that way. So um, he came up and said, what? You know, what's your deal? And of course, I talked for 20 minutes and only stopped when we had to go back on, right? Instead of taking a smoke, they can't talk about knowing. And, and I told them, well, I, I went, I always, I always, to, 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 to maybe a tour of a music conservatory, and we didn't have, my family was really poor, and we didn't, uh, um, like my dad said, we didn't know anybody, so he told me I was going to get drafted anyhow. So he, he had heard that there was a naval school of music and uh, that maybe I should go audition so that if I got drafted that I wouldn't be uh, in an uncompromising position. He drove me all the way to Deep Chief from Cleveland in a little ball fossil that barely fit my, my microphone. And, and I said that, I'm sure the Navy School of Music is going to have plenty of vibraphones. And it turned out in any room with the drum set, it also has a set of mustard gold vibes like five and the beats. So um, I have to unpack my stuff going in an audition. And here's the ugly part. I was six. I, I'm six times four at, right? Yeah. My feet have been out of the soccer playing football in high school. Most so 
shoulders and just look. I was born with that feet. I had the tooth, tooth, there's five human dirt, golf, scoliosis, and uh, um, was legally blind. And they said, well, that's okay. So they sent a message after they saw I listened for them. They sent a message to the Queen and the in place. They said, this guy's going to come through. And he's four and a half all over the place. But just let him through. We're told that we're going to use him in a symphony. You know? Yeah. And so, uh, and so that school, the one that moved camp, they didn't even let me march, Stephen. I swear to God, I made, I made, I said, that I have these parts, and they said, well, okay, try it. I couldn't do it. I was uncoordinated. I was so blind. I wasn't made for that kind of thing. You know, the first left turn, I went right, and they said, okay, sit down, sailor. So I waited in an empty barracks for in a half weeks. First, I was totally alone, smoking my spritz going to eat at the, uh, the mess hall for three, three, four, five, six times back to back for like a third day, and waiting for a hundred or ninety-nine other musicians who were going to be graduated, who and, and sent to the U.S. Navy School of Music in Hammond, Austin, Maryland, which was at that time the most violent city in the United States. Yeah. And, uh, and so, after three and a half weeks, another guy showed up and we smoked cigarettes um, and told every dirty joke we, we could remember for a couple of weeks. And then other guys started striding in. And then pretty soon we got 99 or 100 and we uh, do some procedures to be ready to go together. And then they only oh, check our teeth. And once we from all Massachusetts. Uh, I was there and he comes back and all his teeth are gone, just a couple hours. Every tooth is gone and he's still sitting there, you can't believe it, you know? And now they, if you have any kind of bad teeth, they will use you so that young dentists were not bolting on you, right? So, and this is up my nose. Uh, at the end, two things that he said that I always remember, they're really cute. One is uh, tags for hair tape. That's T A S K S. It's hairy things. Tags for hairy things. You know, and, and the other is, well, that offer now, I got the runs. I got the tags for hairy things, I got the runs. You know, the Jamaicans say, uh, give thanks, they say, give thanks, man. So I thought uh, the very idea of being for aquarium stores, uh, uh, deep sea divers, uh, the water was give thanks uh, at Christmas time. But uh, let's continue, uh, please, oh, with, let's, let's continue, please, with uh, nobody's ever taught you how to live out on the street, and now you're going to have to get used to it. Yeah, but we missed the line before. He's going to the fire school, all right. That's the native school of music. Miss slowly, but you know you only used to get two from it. Because you said it. That's why I can say it. You already said it. Yeah, but I didn't say that I can, that I had um, confessed to him that I came out of there a, a really bad alcoholic. So that's just it. Just it. Uh huh. And something that helped keep you out of the uh, military when you uh, were playing the microphones instead of uh, a, a machine gun. I didn't get that. No, I, I was just saying that uh, what kept you out of the military was uh, or, uh, the uh, action, or what do you call it, the combat, is uh, you played the microphones instead of a machine gun. Yes, that's very true. But that's not part of the Dylan song, and that's we're doing the connection between Buzzy Linhart's uh, advice from Dylan here. Yes, well, Serge was the diplomat who carried on a soldier to the giant thing. Yeah. That was a real cat. The drummer would drive his crow horse, which is coming for a car. Yeah. That's 
in American uh, Indian slang for car, I believe, the comb horse. Yeah. It's a variety of comb horses, diplomat who carried on his shoulder. The, the Siamese cat in an hour needed to discover that. He ain't really where it's at after he takes me everything he could steal. Yes, once he, I wound up at a party at his house, uh, maybe 50 people in this big lot that he managed to uh, rent. And um, I think I had a little acid or a, a small dose, and, and I wound up pulling out my acoustic guitar that I took and played everywhere I went. And I wound up doing an impromptu show to about 50 people. And I was really kind of preaching things and, you know, how we get along and all of that. And, uh, and the drummer, as I left that day, gave me a big hunk of hash. Now, I know that I'm going to go back to someplace where a guy gives me a couple of pens of hash, you know. So I head back over and he tells me to come up and put in the afternoon one day and work there to be alone. And, uh, it smokes me up and give me a couple of lines of speed and, uh, and sit down and I sit down and just talk about things and talk about life. And he says, you know, kid, I used to play drums for him when I was in early holiday. He said, but when Lady Day when Lady Day died, I put my drums in the closet and never touched them again. Wow. But you, some kid, you really got it. And if you'll give me time, I'll bring those tubs out of the closet, get my chops back, and we'll play some music, and we'll do what you say. We'll save this planet. Uh, you know, and they started putting new lines that I had said, and I didn't, I didn't realize that he had heard them. You know, I don't know who this is, but that's all that. There. Um, so, um, yeah. was that, was that, that wasn't Serge, though, was he, was, he, was that Serge, the drummer you were talking about from his drums away? That was Serge. Oh, wow. The diplomat who wrote the so, horse. When he was in the seventh son, was he, like, 40 years old or something already? I would say 40. He tried to be 32, but he looks 42 to me. Wow. So, and, and the secret was he, he, he would dye his beard, beard and you know, if he got his beard, and if he kept his Panama hair on, he was quite bald. But if you look at the photo on the back of one of the Fred Neal albums, you'll see the seventh sons back in Fred Neal. And uh, it's the only picture I've ever seen with Serge without the hat. And he's, you know, looks much older. I mean, one of my twins, the, the one that's hair even a beard in six days, and things that cut his hair anyway and much, and it never thins. His brother went in, uh, went almost completely off the 20s. He's a funny looking kid. He looks just like the phone that I need a vision. It's very nice. And my eyes look sleepy, and his eyes are really sleepy looking. The big guy looks like a little bit more. He's six three and the other kid is five eight and they're fraternal twins. Pretty amazing. They're fifty this year. Um hey, buddy. so there's there's I wish I had all the lyrics in front of me. It would be easier to do. Um if I had all the lyrics, now the thing is... Well, I was just going to say, Buzzy, really quick, I was going to say, you never turned around to see the frown on the jugglers and the clowns, and they all did tricks for you. You never understood that you're not I'm, I'm, I'm not even, I have no idea that, that, you know, people would even talk about me behind my back, because I'm not like that or something. It's very, very... See, one night, uh, I went series I was playing, Six days a week with Tim at the Pine Cafe. With uh, Tim, Tim Harden? Yes. We have a good friend of Tim Harden that just walked in, by the way. His name's Art Pumpkin, Buzzy Lynn Art. Say hi. Hi, Art. How are you doing? Hi. So one night, did he say awful? No, he said, he said hot. I said hot. Oh, 